All right. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight for our Wu Yu event with Dr. Shalu Paul. And she'll be discussing maximizing success with soft multifocal contact lens fitting. I'll be your host tonight. My name is Dr. Arielle Serenzi. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Dr. Shalu Paul graduated from Southern California College of Optometry. She did a cornea and contact lens residency at Northeastern State University, Oklahoma College of Optometry. Um, I was going to say, oh, it's going to make me wing it, huh? <laughs> um, she's a member of the Global Myopia Symposium uh, Planning Committee and ad advisory board member for the Global Council of Myopia Management and an editorial advisor for the Review of Myopia Management. Um, so Dr. Paul is an international lecturer, and I'm sure that you've seen her published in many different journals and um, scientific articles, and she's just an amazing speaker. So you guys are all in for a treat tonight. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you so much. Okay, let's see here. Here are my disclosures. Ariel, thank you so much. And thank you for to Wu Yu for inviting me to be here. Guys, I'm, I'm excited for tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about soft multifocal contact lenses. And before I dive in, I want to tell you a little bit more about my story. Ariel mentioned that I went to SCCO and then did my residency in Oklahoma. I stayed there to teach for a couple of years and then came back to Toronto, Canada, where my family is. Um, I was working for five different locations, different jobs until uh, the opportunity to open my own practice happened. I've been in that practice now since 2008. Time has flown by. We're going on 15 years, which seems crazy to me. I've had to move locations once because that building was torn down that I was first in. I have gone through three renovations, four renovations. I've gone through four renovations. Um, when I started the practice, I had a goal of wanting to create a university without all the politics, which basically meant I wanted to have every subspecialty of optometry within one roof. And I wanted to have a home for people like me because people really didn't want to hire me because I wanted to travel a lot and I wanted to lecture and I wanted to go to meetings and they were just wanted me in the office Monday to Saturday. And I was like, I don't fit that mold. And I said, there's got to be more people like me out there. And I found a whole group of awesome people like that, that are looking to work part time and also bring their specialty to the office. So our office now looks like this. We have six doctors in the office, a whole bunch of amazing staff. I've had so many people tell me tons of no's along the way. You can't do this. It's not possible to do that. But I've had a lot of fun proving them wrong. And um, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy what I do. Specialty contact lenses is one of my areas. Myopia management, as Ariel was mentioning, uh, dry eyes and ocular aesthetics are, are some of the big areas that I focus on. But tonight we're going to be talking about multifocals. And when I think about my career, when I first started the practice, to give you an idea of the location, I'm in downtown Toronto in a very posh area. So I had people coming in that, you know, just did not want to be talking about presbyopia. They did not want to be hearing about being called old, especially from this new grad that they, they were just like, that was not where their head was at. They would come in with dogs in their purses, you know, 80 was the new 40. And it was just an experience where I was like, this isn't working. I had people upset. They were scared. They were nervous. They didn't understand what was going on with their eyes. They felt like I was actually trying to take advantage of them. They thought, what's going on? Why, why are you having me change glasses every year? And then they would say, once you started me with reading glasses, my vision kept getting worse. This is your fault. I should have never listened to you. So like there was crazy stuff that these guys were thinking. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. This is not what I've been told. And I, I knew that I had to figure out how do I, I change this? How do I change this perception of presbyopia and get people to get on board and really understand and feel okay with what's happening? Because we all know it's this natural process that we all go through, but these feelings of, of fear and nervousness and concern, and also, you know, being upset with me. And, you know, I had patients who 
broke down in my chair when I told them that, you know, they were on this path and needing bifocals. They're like, that's my grandmother. That's not me. So I have always been a believer that communication solves everything. And with that, I knew I had to come up with a new way to speak about presbyopia because these old words of getting old were clearly not working in my office. So I knew, knew I needed to come up with a new approach. And that approach I called my system of 10. So I thought about presbyopia and I said, okay, well, what is presbyopia? Okay. When someone is a full presbyope, they have a plus 250 adapter ad. Well, that's 10 quarter diopter steps. So let me talk about the system as a 10 steps of change that we all go through. How many years? Let's say 30 years, roughly. You know, when I started, it would be back in 2008, it was 45, 50 year olds that were coming in and saying, hey, something's different. I now have 30 year olds saying, I can't focus anymore on my phone. So I started to realize, okay, there's this process going on. We can call it 10 steps to change, but how do I describe it? So I started to just talk about this as a reservoir of energy. Our focusing system has 10 units of energy, and we're all going to start losing this. And the fact that it was happening earlier and earlier, I said, we got to talk differently about what's the cause of this, because age is not a good conversation point. My patients don't really like it. When I think about who presbyopes are now, they're not who we think of. We, we're, they're not this old group, right? These people are active, they're fit, they care about their health. This is a new generation of presbyopes. So these conversations of age just are not flying. And when I think about what we do, we refract at 20 feet away. And then people sit in front of devices all day long, right? So we give these beautiful long distance prescriptions and then they sit in front of devices. And that puts such a toll on their focusing system. And we know that that focusing system is having a toll because instead of being 50 and starting this change, it's now happening at 30. So I said, we're definitely going to stop talking about this as an age thing. And we're going to start blaming something else. And that something else is all of these devices. So I really start talking about presbyopia much earlier on in the life cycle of conversations. I'm talking about it with moms and their kids and their teenagers and young adults. And how can we preserve this system? Well, let's go back to the system of 10 and let me give you an example. So let's say someone has a plus one ad. Well, when we're thinking about someone on the plus one ad in this system, they're technically at level four. What does that mean? They need a plus one ad for me, four units of magnifications or four quarter diopter steps. It means they've lost four of their natural units and they have six more to go. Okay, well, what does that mean for them? They can now track where they're on their, their in this process. They know that they have six more steps of change ahead of them. What happens when they reach 10? They all say, well, what happens then? Do I go blind? No, everything actually stops and slows down. And now we have calmness again. But now they know exactly where they are in this process. You have potentially six more pairs of glasses of change ahead of you. But they start to understand, okay, okay, I understand. I'm in this normal, natural process that we're all going to go through. And I'm at level four, got it. And you're going to give me four units of magnification so I get back up to the full potential. I got it. If they run on 60% alone, they're going to fatigue faster. Maybe when they start their day in the morning, they're going to feel great. But by the end of the day, they're going to feel tired. Why? Because they only have 60%. But if I give them back all of their magnification and they're now running at 100%, they're going to feel better, right? Things start to click. They start to understand. I'm not talking about age in this process anymore, right? I'm talking about where they are in this normal, natural process and I'm also talking about the fact that this is happening sooner because of all the devices that we're sitting in front of so much. Well, let's talk about what's the difference between a pair of progressive glasses and a multifocal contact lens. Progressive glasses we know are linear, distance, intermediate, and up close. Multifocal contact lenses are circular. For the most part, distance, mid-range, and near in the center. These little designs that I draw help people really understand what's going on. And it's really important for patients to get this because understanding what simultaneous vision is, I think is a really important piece that they need to understand 
why this takes a little bit longer than fitting a single vision lens. Why do we need to go through this process of fitting multifocals? Why isn't it you just hand me lenses like you always have? What's going on? Well, it's this thought process. I need to see all of these rings of change at the same time. And my brain needs to turn things on and off in order to make this work. So when things aren't working, I also have a reason to explain this because I can't measure how you think. I can't measure your brain function. I can't measure if simultaneous vision is going to work for you or not. That's a you thing. That's not a me thing, right? So this is also a way to understand and get the blame off of me of why multifocals aren't working. There's two people in this in this relationship. It's you and me, and we're trying to figure out how to make this work. And there's some ownership that comes along with simultaneous vision, but it helps people to understand this process. Let's look at, at another example. Let's say someone's at a 150 ad. They're at level six now. I need to give them six units of magnification to get them up to their full potential. They have four more steps of change ahead of them, right? They get this. They know where they are. But what does this translate when we talk about these designs? Well, we know, and again, this is very simplistic, so patients understand. At the top, we have distance in the multifocal glasses, progressives. And as we move down the lens, reading is distance plus six. We have a progressive increase in magnification. They get this. They understand this. They also understand, okay, when we do this in a circular pattern, this makes sense to them too. So how does this really help us? Well, they kind of now understand, okay, I understand the difference between progressive glasses and multifocal contact lenses. When I tell them, I want you to start with one per first, and then we do the other, the other, they get it. These are two different ways of thinking. One is linear, one is circular. I want to make sure they understand why I'm saying we can't do both at the same time. It's two different brain thought processes. You've got to get used to two different systems. So let's do one at a time. It also helps when they say, look, my friends have tried progressive glasses and they don't work. And I don't want to go through that process. So let me just do distance and reading separately. Well, maybe it's because they waited until they were at level 10 before they caved and said, let's go in, right, and try this. And so instead, from distance to distance plus six, having seven gradations, they've got 11 in there. That's a lot to get used to. If you start early, and let's say you're only at a half a diopter of an ad power, there's only three gradations in there. That's a lot easier to get used to. And then we add layers as the years go on. It's they understand why I want them to start with a progressive earlier. The same thing is true with multifocal contacts. When you start earlier, you have less going on inside that ring and those rings. When you wait until you're for until you're a full presbyope with a plus 250 ad, so much more has to go into that lens. That's harder for you. It's harder for me. It's harder for everybody. So starting earlier is really important. When we increase understanding, we really do increase compliance. And that's really important because that decreases frustration. And that also increases trust between us. When someone just tells you what to do and you don't really understand it, are you gonna listen? No, but when you go through and you explain all of this, it really helps to solidify our relationship, gets people to trust you because you're taking the time to explain things and it gets them to, to understand so they will follow along with your instructions. So how do we do that in a little bit more detail? Yes, we have the system of 10, but I like to talk about my exam as a, a discovery. Okay, so you know a little bit about my practice and all the things that we offer. Is it actually possible for me to do all of that in the 20 or 30 minute time frame? Think about how long it takes to do a Blefex treatment or a dry eye assessment or you know to fit a multifocal. All of that takes time. So when I think of my eye exam, I think of it as my discovery. And what that means is I'm spending my time with my patient to figure out everything about them. What can I offer you to make your life better with all the things I know how to do and that my clinic offers you, right? And then at the end of the exam, I go through and I say, here's what I recommend for you. And then from there, we have a mutual agreement where we talk about for example, a contact lens fitting. And I say, here's what we can do for you. And they say, you know what? I'm maybe not interested in this, but I may like this and let's hold on this and let's do this right now. 
okay, we're going to talk about a contact lens fade. And now I'm going to go through this whole process and explain to you how much time it's going to take, the benefits, the strengths, what adaptation is, what simultaneous vision is, what's my plan, how are we going to get you to achieve your goals, and then how much is this going to cost? And then we come up with a mutual agreement that we're going to move forward. And I do all this because I want to uh, make sure we avoid any of those uncomfortable situations at the checkout counter where there are surprises about costs, because that's that's not something that's comfortable at all. But by going through this process, let's say they're interested in multifocal fitting. They're also interested in glasses and some sports glasses, but they want to have a Blefex treatment. Okay, now I take them to my team and they go through all of those in a lot more detail. So my time with them is, again, to learn who they are and give them the recommendations so we can then make good decisions together and they can learn more about what's capable in our office. Let me take a little bit of a side jump to glasses for a moment, because when we talk about presbyopia, I think it's a really important conversation to have. One of the things that I've done is I've changed my conversation. I don't talk about distance, intermediate, and up close. I talk about distance, laptop, and reading. And then I talk about computer progressives as computer and near. It's very important that people understand those differences because it helps our optical when we pick people out, when they say, hey, you sit in front of a wall of computers, your progressives are not going to work. So I always find out what's their computer setup so that I can direct them into what they need with this concept. And really explaining this is really important because this wall of computers it's the reality compared to when we started and it was more so, do you have a computer or not? It's how many computers do you have? Are they in front of you or down below? Like, tell me about your setup. I trial frame everything because I want them to visualize. So in my discovery, I will sit with them in front of a computer and show them and say, hey, is this like your environment? Test out your distances and tell me if this is working so that we have a bit of understanding because I can talk and talk and talk but do they really get it that a pair of reading glasses is different than a pair of computer glasses? Not so much, but when they sit and they put on those readers and go, my screen's a little bit blurry. And then I decrease the magnification and go, oh, my screen's clear, but wait, I can't see up close anymore. Things start to click for them. So this concept of communication and really educating really helps to guess, get people to understand and really, really reduce that frustration. Let's dive back into multifocals. So benefits of multifocal contacts, we know, right? Cosmetics, that freedom, that youthful feeling. We're satisfying these needs and wants. Functionality, being able to see all ranges. You can see here, you can read here, but you can also read up here. That circular pattern gives you so much flexibility. Think about in our exam rooms, to be able to see up close our notes, see the patient, to see across the room, quickly multitasking. The practice, we spend more time with these people. So they really bring a build of relationships. And when we build those good relationships and we help people, they instantly start referring more patients to you. We talked about why it's important to start early. This is one of my favorite, favorite diagrams. When we look here at a low ad power versus a high ad power and a multifocal, you can see the difference. Fewer rings here versus a lot more rings here. This multifocal, if you start here with the high ad power, is going to be harder to get used to than if you start with a low ad power because there's less going on. Simultaneous vision is going to be easier. It's going to be easier for you to adjust to 2020 vision to get that 2020 vision in all ranges. So for me, I always start earlier rather than later with both fitting progressive glasses and with starting with my multifocal lenses. Monovision, not a fan of it. I went into a practice where they didn't have multifocal contact lenses and we had so much monovision. And now people would sit at me and say, doc, I've got a computer now. My monovision doesn't work. And so I had to create these makeshift glasses where we gave plus on the, on the distant side and minus on the non-dominant side to be able to get them to see their screens. And I thought, this is crazy. This is not good for people when we just, cheat a little bit and give somebody a little bit more plus on the non-dominant side. And we do that because we're running out of time and we rush. We end up giving people full-blown monovision and we cheat them from good binocular vision, from good contrast sensitivity and depth perception. And so I really, really avoid this as much as I can. 
Let's talk about all the fitting steps that are involved in fitting multifocals. The really big thing for me is before I fit a contact lens fit, whether I'm talking about soft, GPs, sclerals, I want to clean all of this stuff up first because my life is going to be so much easier when I put a piece of plastic into the eye when all of this gets cleaned up. So really make sure you pay attention to this. Get this sorted out before you dive in. I also like to have a lot of good baseline data. I want to know what's going on with the cornea, with the lids, with the retina. I want a full checkup because I want to make sure I understand what's going on with the eyes before I start doing extra stuff. I want to make sure, hey, that little blood vessel there that's growing on your cornea, did I do that? Or is that something that's already been there? But when we document everything and we take a look, we know what's going on. And it also makes troubleshooting a lot easier. So first thing, really good refraction. When we think of a refraction, I want the least amount of minus and the least amount of add power because I want the least amount to go into those rings. The fewer the rings we have, the easier it is. Eye dominance, our community has spoken. Sensory dominance is the right way for us to be testing eye dominance. And this is where I use a plus 150 or plus two lens over top of one eye at a time. And I check to see which is causing the greatest amount of blur and that's the dominant eye. You can also do that behind a phoropter at the end of your refraction. Use that red lens. Flip in the red lens on one side, flip it in on the other, and toggle back and forth. And whichever one they say looks the worst when looking at an eye chart, that's your dominant eye. The next thing is you want to choose your modality. You want to really understand, okay, through my discovery, I've learned about you. I know what kind of lens is going to be good for my recommendation for you. Then you're going to choose your lenses based on the fitting guide. The fitting guide is the most important thing here. You want to make sure you follow them. Why? Look at this awesome slide here. We've got a patient, same prescription, four different multifocals, soft multifocals right here. Every single one of these patients is starting at a different starting point. If you didn't look at the brand and you didn't look at the fitting guide and you just looked at the prescription and said, I know optics, I know how to do this, here's what I'm going to choose, there's a very high likelihood that you're starting at the wrong spot because depending on which brand you choose, you're going to start at a different starting point. This is just so important that we really pay attention to the fitting guides. Okay. Then we're going to apply the lenses and we're going to let them settle. We need good adaptation because we need them to be able to understand simultaneous vision. So I'll see another patient while they're settling in. They'll walk around the, uh, the office. They'll look at different things. They may be looking at classes, looking at their phone. They know this, though, that they're going to have this half an hour wait because in that intro about multifocals, I told them that. I respect people's time and I want to know that they know exactly how much time they're going to be spending with us. Then we're going to check the fit, and then we're going to check vision. How do we check vision? Put up charts, and I direct them to 2040, especially if I'm dealing with a high ad. I don't want to not say anything because, you know, our patients are going to instantly look at that bottom row and try to get that perfect tiny row. And if they can't, whether it's up close or in front of them, they're going to say they failed and they're going to automatically have this impression that this isn't working and that's not the truth. So set the goal of 2040 and when they can do better than that, get excited with them. You can see more than that. I wasn't expecting it with multifocals. This is my expectations. Now they instantly get excited. If they came in and said, I just want to be able to see my phone without my kids laughing at me out how big this font is, pull out the phone, reduce the font. Can you see it now at a smaller font? The answer is yes, then we've done a good thing. We have success. You want to give people success and wins. And it really comes from talking and give them something to expect. Okay, now let's start troubleshooting. If things not working and they, you know, spend some time in your waiting room, they come in, I want to know what's working, what's not. Were you able to read your phone? Were you able to see far away? Whatever those issues are, I start thinking, what are my strategies to fix this? The one most important is the binocular distance over refraction. Now, this is simple, but it does take some time to get used to. And what are we doing? We're refracting both eyes open. I have a paper chart in my room. I keep the lights on. I have both eyes open. And now what I'm doing is saying, how do I modify these lenses? Okay, so let's think of for a second. These lenses have a sphere component 
and they have a multifocal component, right? So the way I think of this is I'm allowed to change the sphere. I'm not allowed to change the fitting guide, change the ad power. So how do I change the sphere? I refract over top and I'm pushing plus. So I'll have them sit looking at the distant chart. I'll grab a plus a quarter lens and I'll hold it over the right eye and say, tell me what that distance looks like. It's either going to go, oh, it's sharper or mm, I actually don't like it or there's no difference. If it's sharper or no distance, I'm going to keep it there and I'm going to try plus 50. If plus 50 is sharper, or no difference, I'm going to keep it there. If it's plus 75, I shouldn't be plus 75. That means I've over minus them and I should go back to my refraction. Plus a quarter, plus 50, sure. More than that, I've over minus. And this is a nice thing about a binocular distance over fraction because it gives you a chance to check to see if you've over minus them. So let's say they like plus a quarter. Well, now I'm going to keep it there and I'm going to try plus a quarter on the other side. Like it, don't like it, or no change. If they like it, I'll keep it. Try plus 50. If they like it, I'll keep it. Try plus 75. If they like it, I've over minus. Go back to my refraction. So let's say they like plus a quarter here and they didn't like anything here. Before I jump to minus, I'm going to have, they're still looking at the distance. I'm going to pull up a laptop. I'm going to show them their phone, holding that there. Did I fix their issue? No matter what their initial issue was, I start with a binocular distance over a fraction to figure out how do I change the sphere component of that lens to help catch simultaneous vision. I want us to stop thinking about pure optics. This isn't, you can't see far away, so I'm going to give you more minus, or you can't see up close, so let me bump up the ad, because that's not how this works. Simultaneous vision is the key, right? So we think about that complex ring pattern and the brain needing to figure this out. So what am I doing when I'm changing that sphere component? In my mind, the way I think of it is I'm changing those rings in and out ever so slightly to try and get simultaneous vision to catch. That's the way I think of this, right? Now, let's say I push as much plus as I can, can't get anything, plano, plano. Then I'm going to test with a little bit of minus. Does that improve the ranges of vision that I'm trying to achieve? If it's just minus a quarter here, I'm not going to push for more and more minus. I want to separate the gap between the distance and the reading, adding more into that lens design. So the least amount of minus as, as, as I possibly can. If I can't do anything with changing the sphere component, I've maxed out. Now I'm going to go to the fitting guides. And the fitting guides will say, okay, you've tried everything with the binocular distance over refraction. Let me tell you what to do next with the ad power. And I use that ad, that fitting guide to tell me, what do I do next? Because I've done everything I've done. I've done a great refraction. I've let the lens settle. I've checked everything. I've tried to modify the sphere. I'm out. I can't do anything else. And then the fitting guides will tell you. What if you try the fitting guides and it still doesn't work? Start thinking about monocular VAs. I've always told patients from the beginning, this is a binocular process binocular process, both eyes open. Don't do this. It's about how your eyes work together. But if I really get stuck, I might check VAs, but I usually don't have to get there. And then if I really get stuck, I might phone a friend, call consultation, because they're definitely my friends. The thing is, is whatever I decide, I'm only doing one change on the first day because people need to adjust and adapt. And some people take 30 seconds and they've got it. Other people take five days. So I want to give them that chance. So if I change too many lenses on the first day, I'm spinning my wheels. The patient's like, you know, go getting all confused. I, I can't keep up. They can't keep up. So I do one change and I let them go. And then I give them homework. And I tell them, okay, going to go home. I'm going to see you in a week or two. And in that interim, I want you to get used to these lenses. Test them in all the environments where you want to wear these lenses. And then I want you to come back and see me. And in a week. We're going to check and see what's working and what's not working. And I might make a small change that might make this all work. But what happens if you don't prep them, you may lose them because they may get home and say, this isn't working. I'm in a restaurant and it's dim and I can't see up close. I don't like these lenses. But if I told them, hey, you know what? In a restaurant, when it's dim, it may not work as well as it does in bright lights. In that situation, they're going to say, no problem. Dr. Powell told me that this may not work here. I'm still good. And I'm jotting down where it's not working. And I'm going to go and talk to her about that next week. So at the follow-up, what do we do? 
we repeat the same thing. I find out what's going on. If it's working, great. If it, they're happy, I'm not going to do any more work. But if there is any issues, I'll start going through the list again. If there's a problem, I'll do that binocular distance over a fraction. Try and make a small change to see if I can achieve success. One change only. If there's nothing that's coming through with a binocular distance over a fraction, I'm going to my fitting guides and seeing, say, hey, can you guide me of what to do? The fitting guides are really, really important. But what about toric multifocals? we got to talk about these. How do you know if you need one or not? Some people say if you've got half a diopter of astigmatism, you need to use a, a toric lens. Some say if you've got a diopter and a quarter, you don't need it. How do you know? Well, it depends on the patient. And I love my trial lenses. I'll grab my minus 75 sill lens and I will hold it up over the eye that has the astigmatism and I'll just put it there and say, does this work? Do you like this any better? And if they go, oh, no, I, I don't like it. We don't need it. If they go, it doesn't really make a difference. We don't need it. But if they go, that's so much sharper. You know that you need a toric lens. And we have good options here when it comes to these lenses. Optics are not the issue anymore. And I'll talk about how we used to fit these versus how we fit them now. But really, if it's not going to work, it's going to be a comfort issue. And why is it a comfort issue? Most likely because there's dryness, not because there's a true comfort issue. Because our products today we have, we've got really, really good options. If they really, truly don't work, you've got other choices too. You've got GP lenses, you've got hybrids, you've got scleral lenses. We've got lots of options when it comes to fitting our presbyopes. So in the past, how did we fit soft work lenses? We fit the torque part first and we hope that that worked and then we had stability and then we went into round two and we said, okay, now let's put the torque multifocal on. There was no fitting guides. It was trial and error, lots of guessing. That's not how we do it anymore. Products are so good. We do a great refraction. We figure out eye dominance and we dive in. And I just jump right in with the toric multifocal. I use my fitting guides. They are working better than they ever have. So if you've been afraid of trying these soft toric multifocals, I'm going to tell you, really, really do try them. And you know what, folks, the people that actually need these lenses and have been waiting for them for so long, it's, it's sad to say, but they're just waiting for them that they are just, their expectations are a little bit lower. They're just excited to have an option. So, you know, right now, my, my list of those that need soft toric multifocals and a one-day disposable, they're waiting, they're excited, and I know it's coming soon, but hopefully we'll get that there. So modified monovision. I told you I don't really like mono, monovision, but what's modified monovision? And this is kind of where I like to say I go rogue and I don't really have any rules and I don't really listen to anybody and I kind of do my own thing. And there's so many really different combinations of modified monovision. There could be two multifocals, a single vision and a multifocal, a single vision and a toric multifocal, a toric lens and a multifocal, a toric lens and a toric multifocal, all these different combinations that we're not talking taught about in, in our regular fitting guides. And then once we have these one lens and one lens that are different from each other, maybe I'm biasing the dominant eye towards distance a little bit more. And maybe I'm giving the near a little bit more reading. So I get that version of monovision without going full bulb monovision, but I'm kind of testing based on what the patient's telling me. I sit in front of a computer all day and I don't drive. Well, do they need to have perfect 2020 long distance vision. Maybe if I give them a little bit more reading support in that setup, it will work better for their environment. That's modified monovision, right? That's where I'm doing things a little bit different based on what I've learned with these patients. This is where I might check a little bit more monocular VAs and Maybe I might do a little bit more trial and error, but this is really those unique cases where, you know, I've got to try something a little bit different. So let's go over some final fitting tips, okay? Fitting guides, you want to choose lenses based on the fitting guides and to troubleshoot. Realistic expectations, especially with the time it's going to take, what's going to happen in the office, what do you expect from vision, especially depending on, you know, where they are. Are they a low presbyope or a high presbyope? How important adaptation is, keeping the lights on. I'm not doing any of this with the lights off. Real world tasks, right? If I want to look at their phone, I want to look at the things that they're struggling with. Binocular distance over refractions. I'm using loose lenses. I'm not using for opters unless I'm doing my initial refraction. We will 
go further into checking monocular VAs if there's an issue and then thinking about modified monovision. One change at a time, right? If vision is good, let them go, okay? So we can run into situations where we keep asking patients and bring them back for a follow-up and say, tell me what's wrong. Tell me what's going on. Tell me if there's a problem. And I made that mistake because I kept asking my patient, what's wrong? What's not working? And I brought Mrs. Smith back so many times. And then I finally had to say, Mrs. Smith, this is the best that I can do. This is where I'm at. And she looked at me, she goes, honey, I was so happy three visits ago, but you kept asking me if something was wrong. So I kept giving you an answer, but really all was good. So I changed my question. I started asking and started saying, are you happy? Are you good? Because I think that's the more important question. Because if they're happy, then we don't need to keep struggling, keep going. A couple of things to remember. The goal is to meet most of your needs most of the time. Setting that realistic expectation. I'm not telling someone who's a plus 250 ad that I'm going to be able to give them 2020 distance, 2020 up close, 2020 in all ranges in every lighting situation. Not realistic, right? You may need to give up a little bit of crispness for some freedom. Maybe if there's someone that is struggling a little bit to capture all of simultaneous vision and to figure it out, maybe the freedom of not having glasses and reading glasses is worth maybe a little bit of loss in Christmas, right? And that's not that there's a fault with the lenses. That may be just that individual person has too much ad power and their brain just says, I can't catch this. And it's okay to say, hey, this is the best that we're going to be able to do. But when you've done the upfront work and set the ground rules and the expectations, it really becomes a lot easier. Let's talk a little bit more about these designs and go in a little bit deeper into these options. When we think about multifocal designs, we have aspheric design. So in the beginning, that first picture I showed you, we started with distance in the edge and near in the center, right? So an aspheric design, think of a gradual change from distance to near, okay? You can have concentric rings. Here's the distance, here's the intermediate, here's the near. They can be solid circular, or they can be aspheric, meaning that within that ring, there's a gradual change. Now another ring and a gradual change, or it could be a solid prescription in that ring. There could be zones of change in between the rings. Lots of different combinations that you can have. Really understanding the multifocal design, it's important because if you understand that, hey, this patient's brain says, I can't get this. If you know what the other designs are, then you can move to another design that your patient may understand. Do I think that one design is better than the other? All honesty, no. I think we need all of these designs. And the way the companies work is they say, okay, how am I going to fit all of this beautiful optics into this pattern? And they come up with the version of the design that they think is the best. And their fitting guide matches that. For me, I love it. Keep coming up with more options and more designs because I want to have options for my patients. And for me to understand what the different designs are amongst the different companies helps me to be able to move between them, to be able to say, hey, we tried this one design, it didn't work, let's try something different. Really understanding the design. So I want to share this paper with you at GSLS just this in January. Dr. A. Vanderwerp and Giancarlo Montani, they won first prize, first place prize for their paper that they presented. And what they were doing was looking at their power profile, a soft multifocal lenses. I was just blown away by this. Now, they originally did this paper looking at soft multifocal designs for myopia control. But I just want you to look at the work that they did. They used a special analyzer to be able to look at these designs. And I just love these pictures. That So I pulled it right off of their, um, their post. Poster, and it's just a beautiful representation of the different designs that are available to us. And I think we're so lucky that we have so many different options, but I just thought these pictures were really cool. I wanted you to see these. Okay, so what if you do all of this and it's still not working? Well, honestly, when you follow the fitting guides, you can get 96% success. But there are still patients that you're like, you know what, I don't love fitting multifocals because it doesn't always work. Well, what are some of the issues? Is it potentially the design that's not working for someone? Is it that they can't get used to this simultaneous vision? Is the lens just not a good fit? Is it moving around too much, too steep, too flat? Are those beautiful rings 
not in the right place. Look, these guys make lenses quickly on an assembly line, right? What if it's just potentially a defective lens? What if they've got dry eyes? Some more things that could possibly be, maybe it has to do with the pupil size. And maybe that's an issue that's happening. Maybe it has to do with pupil decentration, or maybe it has to do with residual astigmatism. Let's dive into some of these a little bit more. So dry eyes, two parts to a relationship, right, guys? We've got the cornea, we have got the contact lens. We always think it's the contact lens problem. Got to change the lens, got to change the lens. It's not working. We all know discomfort, dryness. Those are the number one reasons why people drop out of lenses, but got to take a look at that cornea. And we got to make sure that we're not dealing with dryness. So don't forget this part of it, two parts to this relationship. Make sure you pay attention to both. I'm going to share one of my tips with you. When I have someone who starts in multifocal contact lenses, who starts in contact lenses, the very first day that they are being taught how to wear lenses, I hand them a bottle of artificial tears. And I'm like, you're now a contact lens wearer. And as a contact lens wearer, you got to use eye drops. Because I'm thinking about this other half of the relationship. I want to protect it. So instantly, I start telling people, you want to wear contacts? You're going to start using moisturizing drops. Why? I want to create a habit from the beginning. And for me, I tag team it with brushing their teeth. Because we do that once, hopefully twice a day. But we get that routine. That's been dr drilled into us. So why not tag team using eye drops with a routine that we're already used to? So I tell people, when you brush, put a drop in your eyes. And from the day they start wearing contact lenses, it's the rule. It's you're now a contact lens wearer. I want to start protecting your cornea. So that way, 30 years from now, you can still continue to wear contact lenses. So what about misalignment? We have natural misalignment in our eyes. And that is the geometric center of the cornea may not line up with our line of sight. Okay, we've heard about this angle, kappa. Well, how do we measure this? And there's different ways for us to measure this. Photos, equipment, and topographers, let's look at those. When you actually start looking at photographs and you start paying attention to people's pupils, you will say, hey, wait a second, they're not right in the center. And what typically happens is the pupil is typically sitting superior and towards the nose, superior nasal. With everything you've learned about scleral lenses over the years, what do we have we learned about the sclera? The sclera is asymmetrical and contact lenses tend to sit down and out. So if contact lenses naturally sit down and out, and that's whether it's scleral lenses or soft lenses, because they're sitting on the sclera and that shape of that sclera causes lenses to move down and out. And our pupil is up and nasal. We've got a discrepancy between where the optics are. That could play a really big role in the reason why your multifocals aren't working. Pupil size is important. And if you've got these complex patterns and they're down here and your pupils up here, that's not going to work. So how else can we look at this? Well, I showed you that pupil image just a moment ago. I have an instrument that helps us measure pupil sizes. And there are so many different devices out there now that will help you take a look at that. It's important to know how big your pupil is. If you've got a really, really, really small pupil, how are you going to get all those rings in the center of that, right? So you got to factor that into this process. And we also have devices that will help us look at misalignment. Look at this graph sort of pulled up a little bit. So here's the geometric center of the cornea, but you can see this is the center of the pupil. This gives us an X and Y coordinates of exactly where that pupil is. And if there is a really big misalignment, maybe things aren't going to work. And the exciting thing that's happening in our industry right now, it's saying, hey, we've got this misalignment. Can we compensate for it? When we talk about scleral multifocals, we can. That's what we're starting to do. We're starting to say the lens is sitting down and out. The pupil is sitting up in nasal. I want to move that optical center up here. Let me decenter optics. And that's a whole topic of conversation that's happening right now. Well, what else? How can we look at topographers? Well, when I train my staff to use a topographer, when they are looking through and they say, okay, well, they're looking straight and things are not lined up and I need them to look over one or two rings to the left or right or up or down in order to get them centered. What is that telling me? That's telling me that they're not lined up. Their line of sight and their geometric center are not matching up. 
So I have my staff tell me, hey, I've had to move them three rings over this way. That's a red flag that, hey, that's a lot of movement. We're not going to be potentially lined up when it comes to multifocals. But it was Randy Kojima who first taught me how to actually use a uh, topographer a little bit more. And what he said was, you know what, when you've got the contact lens on, the multifocal contact lens on, take another scan. And when you take that scan, then use your tangential power maps and look at the difference between those maps. And then you can see where the power profile is of that contact lens. And you can see if everything is lined up. It's a really cool way for us to use our topographer to see alignment, right? If your pupil is sitting high and really nasal, you know that that alignment is going to be, you know, a bit of an issue. You don't have to necessarily go through this step, but we can use our topographer for more things. What about higher order aberrations, guys? We've been talking about higher order aberrations for years when it comes to custom LASIK, right? LASIK versus custom LASIK. We've had tools, so many tools that can measure these higher order aberrations. And I think the key thing we need to know about how we measure them before we get to what we can do with them is being able to understand that we can measure the higher order aberrations of just the cornea, or we can measure it of the entire system. And the entire system includes the front of the cornea, the back of the cornea, and the aberrations of the lens. So all three of those things can create aberrations. And so we need devices that actually are going to create all three, that are going to measure all three to give us true pictures of higher order aberrations. Okay, so do I have an aberrometer in my office? I do because I love tools. And what do I do with that right now? What I do, to be honest, when I'm fitting my multifocal scleral lenses, when I'm fitting my scleral lens patients, when I've got a lot of astigmatism or a lot of irregular uh, astigmatism or keratoconic, I may do this to say, what am I dealing with? Do I have more going on here that I may not be able to fix with? Yeah. And with my soft multifocals, you know, sometimes if things just aren't making sense, I want to have another tool that'll give me another piece to the puzzle. If I've got so many higher order aberrations that there's no way that this is going to work, at least I can have a conversation with the patient and say, you know, you know, between us, I'm not going to be able to fix this in a soft multifocal, but I have an understanding of why this isn't going to work for this patient. And I'm not going to spin wheels testing so many different designs because I've gathered another piece of information that's helping me understand what's going on. All right. What else? What else is there that we can use to help understand our patients? Neural lens. What are we talking about here? We're talking about binocular vision. When dry eyes isn't working, when our eyes aren't teaming together, is there potentially something going on with binocular vision? Now, when I told you all the different things that I do, BV is not one of them. I'm not a BV expert at all, but I do recognize that BV is so important and our eyes need to line up in order for things to function really, really well. And so when things don't often make sense, think about your colleagues that do this and think about doing those binocular vision tests to check your patients to see if there's something going on. Remember the cover tests and our Maddox rods and diving into those type of tests to see what else could we potentially learn. All right. Coming close to the end, why do people not like multifocals? I have gone to lectures and I and I love I love fitting multifocal lenses because I think we can really help our patients when we when we get this, when we are able to help them to achieve more of their goals. But when I ask the audience, hey guys, how many people love fitting multifocals? They laugh. They're like, who loves fitting multifocals? And if I said, who loves fitting a scleral multifocal? They laugh even harder at me. But I do. But what are some of the barriers? People think that they don't work. I can tell you they do. When you start early and you have that low amount of ad, you use your fitting guides and you set the right expectations, you can get these to work. Make your life easier. Don't fit, start with those plus 250 ad powers. Start sooner. Too much chair time. That's not true. When you go through the process and you explain things correctly, when you ask the right questions, when you use the fitting guides, you save so much chair time. And one of the things that COVID has taught us is that, you know, we don't want people coming in so much for, for those fast, those fast follow-ups. So I now have my staff doing follow-ups by the phone before I actually bring them in. And we can ask some of those questions. Hey, how are things going? Are your lenses working for you? Are there any ranges of vision that are not working? If all is good and they're happy, do I need them to come in to tell me that and take up a time slot and say, 
I'm good. I'm good. Great. You're good. Now you can go home. We can do that all over the phone. They're happier. It saves them a trip into the office. We save a time slot for someone else. It just works. Some people think that it reduces your ability to sell glasses. I don't think that's true either because I have a very hard rule that you are either a glasses wearer or you're both a glasses and contact lens wearer. It's got to be both. So remember in the beginning when I showed you the picture of the progressive lens and I showed you about the multifocal contact lens, the reason I show people that and I talk about it is because I am emphasizing the importance of a backup pair of glasses. You got to have glasses first. That comes first. And there's no option for me. If you don't have a good backup pair of glasses, I'm not going to fit you with contact lenses. And people are like, how do you do that? If someone wants it, then you shouldn't you give it to them? No, I don't have to. I'm doing the right thing for the patient by making sure that they have a backup pair of glasses because I don't want them to come back later into my chair with problems from overwearing the contact lenses and having all of these extra issues and complications that I could have avoided by giving the right tools right from the beginning. So people may think I'm a tough person or I'm not being nice, but I'm thinking about the future. I'm not thinking about the immediate. I'm thinking about how do I keep you safe long-term? And for me, that's having a good pair of backup glasses. Now, if that backup pair of glasses is two years old or three years old or four years old, if it's still within driving range that's safe, I'm good. I'm happy. You don't have to update your glasses every year if you're a solid contact lens or, but I need you to have that option. So think about that and don't feel like you, you have to lose that sale out as well. Guys, I want to thank you so much for your time and for all your attention. I'm going to invite Ariel back onto the screen. And please, if you do have any questions, you've got my email address here. And please feel free to, to email me.